Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Military Historians or People Too. We just want to remind you that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are ours and those of our guests. We really appreciate you listening. Please share and enjoy the show. Hey Matt, so I got to tell you guys, like my 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 great friend Sarah Myers just raved about you guys. And well, she's very she's kind. Like, awesome, I gotta yeah. put your contact. Yeah. Oh, I, I I adore Sarah. She's like one of my most favorite people. So she, she's awesome. So yeah. She, so it's thanks, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Can, can you this hear is us? Weird okay? being on this side of the pod. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. You're good. Okay. So, um, we we do we we have in our in our building we we have a digital humanities lab. Yeah. Um. Or something okay. to that effect. Yeah. And so we have a little studio in here, which Brian is usually in solo. But since we're doing this today uh, and I'm down here, we get to be in the studio together. Yeah. We got a mixing <laughs> board back there. You yeah. Can see. Yeah. See that? Um, How cool that is? It's, it's awesome. Uh, I actually have to I have to go buy one of those for an upcoming. <laughs> I'm doing I'm doing our very first live podcast soon. Oh, which I means saw I've got to go spend a whole lot of money. Yeah, yeah. that's going to be stupid. That That's going to be in nuts, that thing. So. It's awesome. It's 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 not hooked and up. I know nothing about this stuff. Yeah. But it looks oh, it's be, it looks very, it looks very nice. What well, it looks like it's very impressive. We You've got like a stuff, like right? is that a speaker or uh, something like that? Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Who yeah, knows? I mean, it's we, just in here. We yeah. got all kinds. Of, I mean, if you, we can, I don't know. There's just random shit. Like, yeah, we got. You guys all, have a poster. I don't have a yeah, poster. We got all the little like you know surroundy things and yeah, soundboard like and stuff. It's actually yeah. okay. Yeah, we convinced some. Well, no, our students get to use it. Yes. Yeah. yeah, they do. Yeah. Not not often That's enough. That's cool. Yeah. But uh, but but they 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 do. We're actually doing a little more with with podcasting. I think we, Brian and I have done a few things for other classes, and right. uh, I interviewed Brian uh, in one of my classes last spring to show him right how it did, and they got to participate and everything. And we've been them to a couple of other places to talk about how we got into this, and yeah, and, you know, so it's so it's been been kind of fun, but. You know, we're we're not in the same same league w- with you, man. I mean, you 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 really oh t- did this did this really well. I, um, I have no fucking clue what I'm doing, man. Like, <laughs> oh, am I allowed to curse on on this pod? Like, I don't know if we're like we started this. I can I can yeah, I can I can we, moderate. Yeah, we we so. usually don't. You know, okay, yeah, but we, not because of us, but because we have some. Uh, I think our listening community is probably okay. Probably skews older. A little Don't bit, but which is also, weird. This is a military podcast. There's also there's also younger yeah. people that listen to all right, it too. All right, yeah. So oh, we yeah. typically try not. I'll give you, to. I'm I'll thinking give you like I'm thinking like Ashley True Luck would probably like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> general General True Luck in the UK would, would yeah. frown frown upon our, our okay. swearing. All uh, right, that, very that good. Sort of thing. I, I, I shall I shall go back into church reader mode, uh, Jason. So <laughs> which is why. something my ex wife. <laughs> oh, she says it. My ex wife loves to tease me. She's like, You go into a room and you just go, you just take over. And you just, you're just like, Hi, y'all. I'm Jason. I'm like, which is my southern accent version of me. So I can, <laughs> I can do that. So, so yeah. Anyway, so thank you guys for having me on. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank fun. you for, yeah. For thanks doing for it. taking the time. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Totally. Uh, I, got, I got a couple of shout Absolutely. outs, Brian. Uh, one shout out to Fall, right? Yeah. It's nice. uh, feels good outside here, here in the southeast. Uh, it's starting to cool off. I think we finally made the turn. Actually, getting a little leaf color up in in South Carolina where I live, and then uh, real quick, uh, as Brian knows, and, and Jason, you're probably not aware, I'm I'm the program director for the SMH's summer seminar in military history, mm-hmm. and we are going to be hosting this at uh, VMI in Lexington, Virginia, in July of 2024, and uh, my my co-directors, uh, uh, Susanna Ural. At, Miss, at Mississippi State and Jennifer Keene out at Chapman and Dave Kieran at Columbus State here in Georgia. Uh, we've started planning and everything. And so if you're a new scholar or advanced PhD student, ABD, uh, keep your eye out for an announcement coming soon through the SMH and HNET, places like that, and apply for this thing because we'll, we'll have a good three weeks there in Lexington. So I just want to plug that. Yep. Good. Great. Uh, great opportunity. Um, only thing I have is a shout out to the German Studies Association. Oh, yeah. I went to their conference this weekend. Very well done uh, up in Montreal. Uh, I have to say I can't pass judgment on the city because it 
poured rain the entire time. Um, so uh, I did sneak out one day, got wet to get some poutine, and uh, it was good. It was good. Um, but I discovered Canadians' tolerance for spice must be really low because I got the poutine that was described as this like fiery, you right. know, and, and and the peppers were like banana peppers. Um, really, really not much spice to it not at all. So, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> but uh, but a good conference. So, uh, nice job to the the GSA uh, organizing committee. Cool. Well, uh, let's get to it. Let's uh, inter introduce Jason. So, Jason Herbert is tribal liaison for the United States Forest Service in Pueblo, Pueblo, Colorado. He is also the creator and host of Historians at the Movies, a podcast that features historians talking about movies ranging from Pretty Woman to Con Air. Jason is also an experienced high school teacher, having taught U.S. history, world history, and economics at the Pine School and the Highlands Career Institute down in Florida. He serves as an ethnographer for the Seminole Tribe of Florida, and he received his Ph.D. in history from the University of Minnesota, where he completed a dissertation titled Beast of Many Names, Cattle Conflict and the Transformation of Indigenous Florida, 1519 through 1858. Jason got his MA and BA in history from Wichita State University and an AA in general studies from Tallahassee Community College. And Jason, I had to throw that one in there as someone who used to take uh, summer classes at Tri-County Technical College in upstate South Carolina. Um, oh, awesome. Jason has published articles in Florida Historical Quarterly, o Ohio Valley History, and Chronicles of Oklahoma. He's also published in the American Historian and Smithsonian Magazine. His scholarship has been supported by Florida Atlantic University and the Huntington Library, the McNeil Center for Early American Studies, the American Historical Association, the Agricultural Historical Society, Historic, uh, History Society, and the Newberry Renaissance Consortium. Jason excels in front of a classroom, and he's won teaching awards at the University of Minnesota, Wichita State, and the Highlands Career Institute. Additionally, he was nominated for the Gilder Lehrman National History Teacher of the Year Award. Ooh. Jason, um, we uh, we know you're no stranger to these uh, formats. You got your own podcast. You uh, you do a lot of stuff online, and we are thrilled to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate uh, being here. I'm I'm stoked. And we're going to work the uh, Roomba and plugging your computer into uh, something on Twitter. That, yeah, yeah, great. we yeah. got it. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll <laughs> oh make sure God. that. Yeah. It'll be our first sponsor. Like, are you tired? Are you tired of your laptop? Are you tired of getting work done? <laughs> Consider a Roomba. And it will, for those of you who are listening right now, we this is the second time we started this because my Roomba unplugged my laptop unknowingly to me. So uh, Jason Herbert. Also, you should put on Tech Wizard onto my CV uh, there somewhere. <laughs> oh my you worked gosh, it out, so right? Bad. You worked it out. <laughs> yes. so, yeah. uh, so Jason, um, you know, we, this, this pod is, is really about you. Um, it's about your okay. work and what you do, but we, we're interested first and foremost in, in how you got where you are. So uh, tell us where you're from, um, you know, what kind of family did you grow up in, what your parents do, and uh, then how'd you get into history? Mm. Sure. Well, man, I tell you what, uh, you know, Brian, I tell you, it is, it is great that we're recording this in Georgia because there was any Georgians understand its circuitous routes via on the highway or on any of the rivers that flow through uh, the Peach State, um, because that's exactly what my path is. And I'll, I'll just kind of start from the beginning. I'm actually hiding a very well ingrained Southern accent. I'm from Western Kentucky originally. I was born in Murray, Kentucky. And then when I was three, my mom and stepdad moved us down to Brobridge, Louisiana, so my dad could work offshore on the oil rigs down there in the early 80s. Uh, wow. So I grew up in like Kentucky and Louisiana um, and getting this mix of both. Actually, you know, my last name's Herbert, but I actually also answered to Hebert. I grew up Hebert, speaking Cajun yeah. French uh, from a very young. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, there are many names that I respond to, uh, some of which I, we won't refer we won't refer to on said podcast. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, and then we moved back up to Kentucky with a slight detour through Tennessee. So, you know, uh, one of the interesting things I well, the things about me is that I'm really kind of a Southern guy. But it, it's like a lot of folks who come from an area. It was the thing that I always kind of wrestled with. You know, and I was talking about this on Twitter the other day about there's this really great song by Nitty Gritty Dirt Band called Home Again in My Heart. I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with this song, but it's it's largely about this guy who's kind of singing back and reflecting on his life. It's the reason why I love some of these songs like this. And he's really kind of talking about how he had to get away from his small town. Can you can you hear my dog in the background? Um, dogs are welcome. We are, yeah, dogs are we are pro dogs dog. Oh my podcast. gosh. So 
<laughs> I am a dog owner as well for the last like eight weeks. And oh my gosh, mistakes I've made in my life, Buster being one of them. <laughs> um, I kid, I, I love this guy, but oh my gosh. For those of you who have not had a dog in quite some time, it's like having an infant. You know, it's yeah, all we, over we know. again. I mean, we, it really is. You, you need uh, to, it's you, so hey, much, right? Shoot, shoot us a, a picture yes, of Buster. Yeah. Shoot, we'll, we'll oh, I, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Shoot okay, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah. Um, okay, so back back to Kentucky. You know, it's like that old Teenage Mutant Ninja, Teenage Mutant Ninja uh, Turtle song. Back to the story. It's not hard to find. Ninja's not just of the body, but of the mind. That's what history is. Um, I'm going to go way back here. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I grew up, I really wrestled. With the idea of being from the south and come from a very conservative christian small town i grew up southern baptist uh we're kind of talking beforehand and that kind of in some ways kind of even though i'm not a religious man now you know there's there's still these weird ties to being from the south and coming up in a culture uh that still kind of inform who you are or maybe wrestle against and things like that so uh, you know came up through high school um i did, had no idea what i was doing uh, you know i come from a very poor family growing up very salt to the earth uh both my parents were high school dropouts, you know? Uh, so, it, and when I, we get to, to where I'm talking about teaching, I, I saw this firsthand is when your parents, when your family does not have success early on academically, it really makes it difficult for you to as well. Now that's no excuse. Cause my parents did say, Hey, go to class, take your, you know, do your homework. I just didn't want to. Right. Yeah. So I kind of famously go to Murray state university in my hometown, which is a great school, very similar in a lot of ways to Georgia Southern. Um, and I'm such a big fan of those of those kinds of schools. Didn't appreciate it. Didn't know what I was doing. Promptly flunked out twice. Right. So like mine, man. Yeah, you're, yeah you're, man. You're, you're you know, in good company. <laughs> it's just and that's the thing is like and, I re- and again, this is one of the things that I think really kind of informs my own scholarship or kind of my personality. And I kind of operate with the chip on my shoulder. You know, Brian, you're saying, like, where are you in, in Colorado? I'm in Pueblo, which is like the chip on your shoulder town of Colorado. And we'll, <laughs> right. We can get to that here in a bit. It's just kind of I, I'm just always kind of seeking out confrontation. Yeah. Um, but we'll go. You know, we'll talk about that. Anyway, long story. Uh, go into a career selling cars. And then mortgages, I was famously selling more and famously, I'm kind of overinflating my own value here, but that's what historians do. Um, <laughs> I was selling mortgages during the mortgage crisis, you know, for subprime lenders. Like we we showed the big short on historians movies the other day. And I'm like, yeah, this is accurate. This is accurate. This is accurate. You know, <laughs> um, anyway, and then the whole world collapsed. Right. And my wife at the time, who remains uh, one of my absolute best friends in the world, it's just like, you know, you're not happy. Why don't you just try to go back to school? And I go back and I go to Tallahassee Community College thinking I would just go in, get something done. It always kind of bothered me that I was a smart guy, but never finished my degree. Right. Yeah. So the idea was just idea was to go in, get a degree at TCC, which is still to this day my favorite school I've ever attended um, because they gave me the opportunity to go back. You know, TCC gave me everything. And I am such a fan of community colleges for that reason. They give so many opportunities to so many people. I remember I, I flunked out of Murray State. I came into TCC with like a like a 1.05 GPA or some crap, right? And I remember sitting down there with the people at financial aid. They're like, are you serious about this? And I'm like, yeah, I'm real serious. Just one chance, you know? And I went back and did all, all the cl- cl- courses and then matriculated up to Florida State, which is a, a place that I dear, dearly love. Um, and then my uh, my wife got a job at a uh, at a at, out in Kansas. So I ended up having to transfer out to Wichita State, which is where I did my bachelor's degree. And you know, along the way, I just fell in love with history. Like maybe I always kind of knew because I was always like this Cliff Clavin esque dude, uh, you know, amongst my friends. I was like, actually, and I was like, you know what? Actually, I want to be the guy with with the degree because then people will listen to me. No, no that's not what happens. Actually, um, no one listens to me in my family or my friend, you know, my friends will, but my family, God, good God, no. Um, but I've got student debt to make them want to listen to me. Uh, so so, anyway, long so were, were you like, were you like Brian when he would come home from school and they would refer his family and uncles would refer to him as college boy? Not so much uh, because <laughs> I wasn't near my family. I, you know, okay. I have a great uncle who left Kentucky. Most of my family is still in Kentucky within like a 15, 20 mile spread in like Murray, maybe as far East as Hopkinsville, or as we know there colloquially as Hoptown, uh, which is close to Fort Campbell, Kentucky for people who are listening. It's about two hours North. People are like, are you near Louisville? I'm like, no, not at all. We're closer to 
you know, closer to Nashville, uh, you know, geographically. And as a Kentucky basketball fan before and anything else in life, I want nothing to do with the city of Louisville. It's also too close to Indiana, which is a place that I hate with the fire of a thousand suns. So um, long story though, I uh, get, uh, get up to my master's degree, get my master's degree through Wichita state had the most amazing care. It's amazing. I will tell you this, the support I had from my people at Wichita state, is unrivaled. Um, so for those of you who are going to like uh, a state school or an Ivy league school or think about our community college or an R2 or something like that, I will tell you the education, the best education I got was actually at Wichita state under the leader, the guidance of a guy named Robert Owens. He's actually a few years older than I am. He's incredibly kind, caring, supportive, wonderful human being, right? This dude got me, you know, I ended up going through my divorce towards the end of my time at Wichita state and beginning at my time at Minnesota and this dude pretty much just propped me up and was like, you're going to get through this, you know, come hell or high water. Right. And actually, and I will tell you that, you know, people like Jay Price and uh, George Diener and John Dryford, all these folks over at Wichita State were the exact same way. It was a small department, maybe eight, nine full time professors over there. Not a ton, a lot of resources at a school like Wichita State, but what they have are golden human beings, just golden, amazing, wonderful humans that I cherish to this day so, so you're talking about their history department right oh yeah yeah, yeah so how, how did how did you gravitate to that well and so let, yeah. first yeah. to be clear so you you didn't finish at florida state you transferred no. to wichita transferred okay. to wichita right. state and that was a difficult thing because i was really angry actually because the school itself can burn as far as i'm concerned uh i have two different feelings towards the department and the school because the school actually re- florida state accepted all you know i went back to tcc and redid all my classes that i failed at murray state and to get my GPA up high. Yeah. And because, and then Florida State accepted those things. And then when I go to Wichita State, they wouldn't accept those as a replacement grades. They averaged them and that brought my GPA down. And that kept me from getting into programs earlier. It actually ended up costing me a ton of money because of Wichita State at the times, very antiquated thinking of academia and so forth. It actually really held me back for a long time. And I'll be honest with you, I actually have very conflicted feelings towards how I, I, to this day, do not have a Wichita State frame on my wall because I'm still angry at the university for costing me a bunch of money and time. You should Um, be specific because I I would wager that you should be angry at the registrar. Yeah. Oh, that's exactly (laughs) who I'm angry at. That's who you should be. And I'm married married to a registrar. So I I know of what I speak. Don't don't be mad at the shockers in general. Yeah. (laughs) No, no, it's, it's, you know, so... It was definitely the registrar and under a certain administrator, the the Donald yeah. Baggs presidency at Wichita State. And again, since uh, that guy ended up retiring, they've had a collection of really good presidents uh, since then. Yeah. But that just still doesn't change the fact that they cost me years and money to to go there. So it's, it's a frustrating thing. It's like this duality. Thing. And I think we know this departments are separate from universities in yeah. a lot of different ways. Yes. Um, so... Long story now, I sound like an absolute jerk wad for like bagging on a school I've got two degrees from. Um, look, history is complicated. Contingency. What do you want to say? History words. Um, end up going to Minnesota, getting my my doctorate uh, from there um, and how, uh, focusing. How did, get, how did history come into play, though? Why, why did you gravitate to that? It actually happened in Tal- at Tallahassee Community College. I went in thinking I was going to do like a... a like environmental stuff, which ended up being, I ended up being an environmental historian after all these years. But I remember sitting in history classes going, man, I really dig this. I like to talk about TR, you know, Theodore the- Roosevelt. And I like, I liked foreign policy and I like this and that. And, you know, I took a course on terrorism because I still thought maybe I'll do, do some kind of government policy kind of a thing at uh, Florida state and took a course on terrorism on the uh, Irish Republican army. Um, and just fell really into like history. But when I got to Wichita State, um, they didn't have anything on Ireland, but they had Robert Owens who did like Borderlands and Frontiers. And I'm from the South. I'm like, all right, well, they've got stuff on native folks. I'll, I'll just do that. Like, it wasn't like, I could do history like anything. I just like history. I like storytelling, right? I mean, that's ultimately kind of the crux of who I am leaning into this idea of like who I am as a person kind of manifested itself as, as a profession, which is that, I like telling stories. I like knowing people and understanding people and maybe giving some, 
I don't know, giving some some kind of uh, understanding of pe- a person's experience here on this uh, on this world. So that was what happened. And I was really fortunate enough to be fostered again by some really phenomenal, not just scholars. And I talk about this a lot in terms like you know, I'll talk about this on terms of like uh, Twitter and stuff like that. You know, in this field, we are surrounded by really smart people. Right. Just there's tons. There's no shortage of smart people. But what I find is that there's actually a shortage of really kind and good people. And I think that sometimes it, we say, oh, this person's a great person. They're kind. And it's almost like a so it's like a brush off it's a, to excuse the fact, you know, maybe the scholarship's not as good or something like that. But it, this is actually the opposite. Right. Because I actually hold kindness and humanity far above intelligence or ability to write a book or anything like that. So when I say that Joanne Freeman is one of my favorite people on the planet, it's because she's a kind, good, good human being. You know, Heather Richardson is a kind and good, you know, mentor to me who has always been there for me. You know, there's never a time when I can't pick up the phone and call her and be like, hey, I got questions, not on history, but on life. And what do I do here? You know, these are these are the people that I want to surround myself with. And I had those kinds of people at Wichita State. And I was like, all right, cool. These are kind of good people. I want to kind of go. This this only encourages the career path when you think these are the kind of people I want to be. And like, we have this guy, his name's John Dreyfer over at Wichita state. He's an elderly gentleman. He looks like the textbook history professor. Just John is just a devastatingly handsome 76 year old man. Just, just, you know, um, but where's like the old uh, jackets, the, the, the sport coats with the, with the patches and all oh, that. Yeah, it's, yeah. What, it's what Ian Isherwood's going to look yeah. like in about. Oh my gosh. Years. He's yeah. great in the classroom. <laughs> oh, I had, Adore that man to this day. His uh, son was a, a pitcher in the Major League Baseball, Darren Dreifert. Wichita State was like this big hotbed for baseball for a long mm-hmm. time. Um, so lo- long story. These were like people that I found that I really dug and liked. And I was like, all right, cool. I'll go be I'll go be like one of these cool people I dig and like. I just couldn't see myself like a lot of people they get in this profession. I couldn't see myself doing anything else. And I found that I got this real rush when I was teaching courses in front of students, I was good at it. Even before I started teaching the classes, you know, I was, I was always the the older, cause I went back to school when I was 31. So I was always older than my, than, than my, than my peers mostly. Um, but I was always the guy leading the study groups before class, you know, making sure we all got A's, you know, rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing. I was like, let's all do this. Let's, uh, let's kick the crap out of this test, you know? Um, and I wanted to do that. And I just found that I really dug I really dug that that idea of cooperation. Frankly, I like the attention, um, and that's you know. And Jason, I like to stop you there. I yeah. can't imagine that you like attention. I know it's crazy. Right? <laughs> uh, our, our listeners should know I'm also like three quarters through the cup of like Cuban coffee right now. Which, if anybody knows me, knows this is what I run on. It's um, this is my jam. So yeah. yeah. Anyway, so long story. Yeah, um, that's why I got into it. And well, like I said. I want to ask you about your dad for a second. Because, yeah, go ahead. You know, when I started Facebook stalking you last night, there's a picture on there of him sitting there in a Stetson yeah. tattoo on his arm. Yeah. And uh, my dad is free of tattoos, but otherwise my dad used to wear a, a gray Stetson. And yeah. I just, I was like, we probably grew up in the same house. I mean, my dad was a, was a brick Mason. Um, so you're talking about all these great people emotionally supporting you. And I'm willing to bet that your dad was not a warm and fuzzy guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he wasn't. You know, uh, he, he, you know, but that so so here was the fun thing. I, I'll tell you about the the fun parts of going through graduate school. Um, so my dad, uh, you know, my, my dad was nineteen when I was born. I always, you know, I talk about Star Wars. My dad, he's a nineteen year old kid. Like I was born on Ju- in July. Oh, fuck, it's 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 on it's on the internet. I was born in July nineteen seventy seven. Right, so Star yeah. Wars is still out. He went to go see Star Wars the day I was born. Like I was born at three sixteen a.m. For those of you who are trying to crack my passcodes right now, um, my favorite color is blue. Uh, and he went to go see Star Wars that day. But, you know, my father, and I'll send a picture. Like, my father was like this very, was like this man's man kind of guy. He he, he caught, you know, the marriage did not last long because uh, they were children when I was, uh, you know. And what we didn't know about my dad, my dad passed a few years back, is that my dad was dyslexic. Um, like myself, my dad was probably autistic. Uh, I'm autistic, which I didn't understand until my children were diagnosed as autistic and starts to understand. He was also, you know, my father was, and because of this dad suffered from depression, alcoholism, which ultimately killed him, um, worked in factories and this real hard scrabble life, you know, and we lived three hours away. And I think sometimes I, you know, growing up, we moved off to get off to Louisiana. My thoughts, man, is that 
it kind of broke him in some ways whenever I think about it. And, you know, I didn't see my dad for the last 10 years before he died. Mm-hmm. And it's because his alcoholism was so bad, you know, and at that point in time, I'd already had uh, two kids. I only have two kids that I know of. Um, and <laughs> I had thought <laughs> that my first job as a father is always to protect my children. And that yeah. means protect them from anyone. And I'm not going to bring them around. My father was a guy who literally, and I don't want to paint this awful picture of him because he was in his own way, a very loving man. And I think of very often, I actually sent that picture that, that you were referring to my sons the other day. Um, you know, dad couldn't get out of bed without, without whiskey, like literally could not get out of bed without having whiskey next to him. Yeah. Um, so he was in a bad, he was, you know, he was in a bad way. And I think in a lot of ways, part of my way of rebelling against his, uh, him and his memory was to not become a hunter and fisherman um, and was to kind of become a kind of nerdy Star Wars kind of liking kid and the intellectual version uh, of him, if you will. Yeah. And of course, the great irony is I, as I got older, I really started to go back to embrace those things that he taught me about catching yeah. fish, hunting, spending time outdoors, getting tattoos. I don't know. Um, being rugged. So, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's, it's, it's weird. What, you know, it's, it's interesting. The three of us are all, all historians, right? Because so much when I think about my father, I have to parse between memory and nostalgia yeah, uh, sure. and how that informs who I am as a person. So, you know, that was dad, you know, and a lot of my life, I think like a lot of men, whether you've got a great father, a distant father, or don't know your father, whomever, right. Comes through like, understanding your role in this world through the, through the, through your father. And my dad wasn't around, but my grandfather was, and I named my son after or my second son, after my grandfather. And also my, my ex-wife who again, just lovely human being, her stepdad, he came into my life. And when I met John, her stepdad, I was like, this is my dude, this guy, mm-hmm. This guy got me and I came in, you know, and I met John when I was like 27. John was like, uh, was Christine's late stepfather. I, I don't want to talk too much because uh, he's passed as well now. But man, I met that dude and I was like, oh my God, this guy. He taught me about cooking and wine and Jimmy Buffett. And I was like, these are the other parts of my life that I needed to unlock. Right. Um, and he was amazing as well. So uh, yeah, you know, th- so the dad thing wasn't really around uh, growing up. I kind of, and I feel like, you know, it's now as I'm a father now, and I remember when I was getting divorced, I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to become my father. I'm going to become an alcoholic. I don't really drink. I mean, I there's some bourbon over there, but I'm from Kentucky. It's kind of like rule. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you about that later. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you know, it's uh, I think that, you know, dad definitely had an impact on me just in different ways. And I'm still trying I'm still trying to understand who I am through his through his own memory. Yeah. Um. All the way up until now, I'm 46 now. I, I don't know that that goes away. And I kind of wonder how that might reflect through my own sons, Jack and Ben, as they get older. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's, uh, well, you know, clearly you're, you're passionate about, uh, you know, talking right here and, and everything you do, but all these experiences, I'm sure, I mean, that's probably plays a big role in what makes you so good in front of a classroom. I mean, students feel like they can relate because you, uh, you've, you've done so many different things. Well, thank you. I, uh, the thing I would tell my, and I hope if any of my former students are listening right now and I, the thing I would always say in front of my students, the number one thing I would always say when I was teaching, especially when I was teaching high school, because it comes across differently in, in front of college students, which is, I love you guys. I mean, I'm not kidding. The words I would say most in front of them is, I love you guys. They would hear from me at least every single day. Because, you know, when I was teaching middle school, eighth grade, and also high school, pardon me, um, both at two radically different places. Highlands County, Florida is the poorest county in the entire state of Florida. The Pine School is a place in uh, Hope Sound, Florida, on the Treasure Coast that is one of the wealthier areas in the state of Florida. I literally had FDR's descendants in my classroom. Wonderful kids. Um, I won't say their names, but they, if they're listening out there or wherever, I got all those guys. Uh, but I loved all those kids. I mean, you know, they're, defi- they're definitely listening. Yeah, they're listening. We, uh, we definitely, our, we, right? We get a lot of the yeah, FDR. Yeah, and, yeah. We, we appeal to that, to that crowd. <laughs> I'll, I'll post a link to this. We, we, I, we I know a lot of my former But, you know, the thing is that this. I found that students, whether you come from a poor background, from a wealthy background, whatever, that does not, you know, they still have the same kind of issues and problems with good parents, bad parents, hard, you know, understandings of who they are, sexual identity, who I, identity questions themselves, wondering who, because you know, that's the, that's what you do as your kid, right? Yeah. And 
the thing I always want people to know, and I say this when I'm in the classroom, or if you may have seen me talk about this on when I've talked about HATM or so forth, is that whoever you are, I want you to know that I love you and that you are welcome around me. Like you are welcome here. This is a space. I don't care who you are, where you're from, except for Indiana um, or anything else like that. This, <laughs> When you are around me, you are in a safe space. You are in a place where you are wanted and loved and cared for and valued. And I'm, for I'm the really young feeling people. feeling self-conscious because I don't give a rip about my students. That's just, Oh, well, yeah, exactly. Really, this is really so, important yeah. to me. Well, look, yeah, Jason, you know, well that's the thing. Let's 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 move to yeah. uh, your your current job if, yeah. with, with the Forest Service, which you just mm-hmm. started recently, right? Yes, I mean, you've only been out there a short time in Colorado, right? Um, you know, you're you're a tribal liaison mm-hmm. with the Forest Service. Got a PhD in history. Yeah, how does all that come together? You know, what 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 is? Tell us what you do, what the job is, and, and sure, and how definitely, you and all that. Helps so, you. for people who don't know, HATM does not bring in any money at all. Right. It's entirely famously nonprofit thing. So I have to do other things to and that's by design. I don't want to take make, make money directly off of HATM. It belongs to the community. Um, I feel strongly about that. So uh I wow, do have to make, have a makes money off that. Uh, we, yeah. we'll make money if anybody yeah. Right. yeah wow. Um I, I think that there's maybe a perception <laughs> we'll, because we'll talk it's about so public. Way. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been very blessed and fortunate to I had an offer to come out here to work for the Forest Service. And this is a, I'm gonna tell a backward story here. Um, I've been out here for about uh, eight, nine weeks now, and I work out here in Pueblo, and I serve uh, four national uh, forests, if you will, the Comanche, the Comanche National Grasslands, San Marano National Grasslands, uh, uh, Pike National Forest, and San Isabel National Forest. And my job is a tribal liaison, which is a fairly new position out here. I'm the first person to ever have it. Um, and we're seeing a lot of tribal liaisons uh, positions being uh, established not only in the Forest Service, National Park Service, throughout federal government, largely through the Biden administration, through this renewed commitment on the part of the federal government, current administration, to understand that all lands are indigenous lands, right? Um, the lands in which I work and help to co-steward are indigenous. They are the homelands and current lands of you know, multitudes of people who have been here for generations, who love and cherish these lands, who uh, they're, we talked about identity earlier, their, their identities themselves about who they are as a person, as, as native, as part of a, a community, are, are informed by their relationships to this land. So we have a real responsibility to ensure that these lands are being managed in ways that are appropriate to indigenous communities. Um, and ultimately that, that serves everyone. This serves not only indigenous communities, that serves a, a uh, taxpayers, non-native folks, uh, taxpayers as well. T- tax, uh, it serves the visitors to our country uh, as well who come in to see these amazing places. I was just down in San Isabel National Forest on Saturday hiking on a mountain up that way, not because it was my day off, but because I have a responsibility to learn these landscapes so that I can serve these indigenous communities. So, and I came to this position, I had three amazing, wonderful years serving the Seminole Tribe of Florida as an ethnographer, working on a project for them, getting to know tribal members down there. I'd written my dissertation largely on Florida, on native Florida history, and got to know some tribal members. And then ultimately that kind of segued into working, uh, serving, I don't like to say working for, sir, I always consider my positions as a service to the tribe. Uh, And I didn't like talking about that position when I was there, because I didn't want to seem like a guy who was using the tribe uh, as a way to increase my stature as a scholar, right? It was like, oh, look at me. I work for the tribe, and now I want to become a professor of Native history at some place. Um, I wanted things to come organically, and I and never wanted to be in a position of taking from anyone, especially Native folks. Um, so I've always kind of wrestled, actually, with talking about my service. Um, but I had, I had the better part of three years of uh, serving the tribe on this contract. Um, and had this amazing time, still have amazing relationships with a lot of folks down that way who, and I always say this, I'm like, I love three things in the world. I love my family, state of Kentucky and the Seminole tribe of Florida. That's what I love. Um, and then I also had an opportunity. (laughs) Exactly. Um, and then I also had a chance to work, uh, to serve, uh, a company owned by Eastern Manor Cherokees called Gadua uh, on a grant after, after my time with the Seminoles ended. And then that kind of transitioned out here. And it was difficult because Florida Atlantic university had offered me a position teaching, at a university down in Florida where I could teach native history, be close to my kids. And 
So why in the hell, heck would I choose to go 2,000 miles away from my children? And I felt, gentlemen, that my that I needed to be here, that I needed to continue to serve Native folks, at least for a little while longer. Like this was a thing that I needed to do. I wanted to give my life as a life of service in a lot of different ways. And it's easy to be cynical about that. But I wanted to be out here. I'm, I'm not the expert in Southwestern Native history. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not, you know. I don't know what it's like to be native. I don't know what it's like to grow up, but I I want to try to help understand and try to do what I can for folks. So I felt like this was a place I wanted to be. And thus far, I've had the chance to meet with some amazing folks. And, you know, it's it's early in the process, but I'm, I'm very happy and honored to serve their needs. So have you ever spent any time in Colorado or out, out West? Yeah, I, I have. Um, yeah, good. Yeah, I, I, I dated someone uh, who I almost married. Uh, that I met on Twitter. Yeah, we've all been and there, then, except for the Twitter part. Yeah, uh, she was in Colorado, still is. And then we ended up breaking up during COVID because we went like 15, 16 months without seeing each other yeah. because we were trying to not uh, spread the virus and do the right thing. And ultimately it was like, well, we're probably never going to see each other again. Let's let's break up because uh, uh, this way we can remain friends. Um, and that was that was a brutal, difficult thing um to to go through but i went through so i would but i would come back and forth prior to covid from florida to colorado a whole bunch and i fell in love with the state it's really an amazing yeah. place yeah, well, I, I lived in utah for for about 10 years and, oh i'm going to utah and, like two weeks yeah. yeah and and just really loved it um, yeah it's it's great so uh you know the the thing that's kind of put you on the map uh with the the broader public is historians at the movies yeah. um so tell us you know how you developed the idea, what you do, okay. and um, you know how do you pair movies with historians? Sure. Um, so HATM was a total fluke, a complete accident. It wasn't supposed to happen or anything like that. You know, I was living down in Florida, surrounded by a bunch of gopher tortoises, um, with not a whole lot of outlets. And you know, one of the things that happened was like, you know, and this is what, what I think a lot of us are down are kind of lamenting the downfall of Twitter was that after I left Minnesota to move down to Florida, uh, to write my dissertation and be close to my voice, I, I really was losing that academic community. Um, you know, so much of what you do in graduate school for people, for our graduate students who might be listening right now, so much of, your, of what you learn is not in the classroom. It's in the hallways, talking to your colleagues. It's, yeah. it's, it's in, it's yeah. at the bar afterwards. That's informing who you are as a scholar. Right. And I lost that because I didn't have that community where right? I was living in this tiny little town called like Placid. And I just started getting active on Twitter. And I'd post pictures about turtles and all this kind of stuff, whatnot. But um, I had noticed that national treasure uh, was available on netflix and i used to have this argument with a friend of mine who's an archaeologist and essentially the idea is that you know archaeologists get harrison ford they get you know they get indiana jones and historians get we get benjamin franklin we we get we get nicholas cage we get national treasure right yeah. <laughs> but we all love this movie it's completely silly it's kind of what it plays with history but we all kind of love the movie for what it is and i'd seen that it was available on netflix and literally literally had tweeted out Hey, it's on Netflix. We just we shall watch it sometime. And people responded back, yeah, let's do it. Okay, Sunday night. Cool. And this was like a random Sunday in July in 2018. And um, we all got together, started watching. We created a hashtag just because so something fun. This was not planned out, right? Um, and part of the idea was like national treasure was not something you have to think heavily about. And as scholars, we think so heavily about things all the time. I thought maybe it might be cool to like on a Sunday night, turn off the brain a little bit. This is exactly what the opposite of what ends up happening. But we ended up tweeting along, had a whole bunch of people come along, including the writers of National Treasure. I ended up talking Joanne oh, Freeman wow. into oh, awesome. Yeah. Huh. Uh talked Joanne into getting a Netflix account back in the day. I hope she does. And mind me, like I cost Joanne Freeman $14. Um <laughs> and a whole bunch of other folks, right? And we did it, it was this amazing time. It was great. People were like, hey, let's do it again. Okay, yeah, sure. Next month. No, let's do it next week. All right, cool. So we'd end up doing Lincoln, right? And then we're doing Murray Antoinette and then Coco and then Trading Places. And then we are off to the races. And it's been every weekend for over five years now. Wow. Um, yeah. Every and weekend. Every weekend. Every weekend. And during COVID, we were actually showing films three times a week. Because remember, during co early days during yeah. COVID, there was no basketball, there's no baseball, there's no football, there's no nothing. So we were showing films like three times a week and I was getting exhausted. It actually takes a lot of time to like sit and figure a movie out, figure out who we're going to invite on, 
watch the film sometimes beforehand, you know, tweet it up. Uh, I've had people, I have people like uh, my amazing friend, Rachel Gunter, who often will co-host when I need a break. And her first time she did it, she was like, how do you, how do you tweet so fast? Like, how do you, how do you keep up with everybody? Because it's a lot when you get a lot of people in the night that we did Hamilton, you know, we were in the New York times that night, just because oh, people we were tweeting yeah. back and forth and we're, we were trending, we were trending along with that, you know? So, um, so that's how it got started. It's been going now for five years. And again, the biggest idea behind it is community. And like I said earlier, so, as far so as- in other words, you, you, you in essence built up a, a community on Twitter first. Yeah. yeah. Then started the podcast. So you had a built in audience. Well, for the podcast. yeah. Is that fair, the, or? The, yeah. The podcast is new. Podcast last, uh, launched last December. Right. Um, And through a lot of different reasons. And I'll get, kind of get into that. You know, so the HATM Sunday Night Watch Party had been going for about four years, but it was, I was getting tired, you know, after four years in, I got, I was, I was in a relationship with uh, someone and got broken up with, just got my heart just absolutely just dismantled. This is a a common denominator. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, actually, every time I break up, I get a new tattoo and my arms are getting full. Wait, let me guess. There was a relationship (laughs) and he breaks. Oh yeah, dude, dude, just just get the crap kicked out of me. Um, but I was really pissy, uh, if you will, um, or for the for our British friends, pithy. Um, yeah. So, uh, and I was going to cancel all of each. I was like, "We're done. I'm done. I'm expendable. This whole thing's expendable. I'm, 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 I'm shutting it down." And everyone was like, "No, you're not. You belong to us now. You have to continue." And it really actually meant a lot to me. A lot of people actually wrote to me and were like, "Hey, you know, this. I get why you want to quit, and it's totally cool. And thank you so much." Um, but the overwhelming response told me we had to keep going. And then as a result, I was like, well, if we're going to keep going, we have to change. We have to grow. We have to do something different. Um, and I was, you know, I don't like talk to her, talking about her a lot because in a lot of ways, this is kind of like uh, my time, with, time with, with the tribe. But Heather Richardson is as influential in my life as any human in the world because she's been like a big sister to me. And she she kind of sat me down. She's like, you have to keep going. Don't quit this. This is what you do. This makes me, makes you happy. Do the podcast. She's like, do the pod. She's like, you're ready for it. Um, she has not been on the podcast yet, by the way. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, so we ended up do- launching the pod back in December. It's produced actually by a great friend of mine in uh, Wichita named Fletcher Powell, who's uh, uh, who, who helps run the KMUW station out there. Uh, wait, NPR wait, we, okay, there. we have to stop. Yeah, so yeah. you've got a producer. Do you have a producer? Okay, yeah, you, yeah no, wow. but, yeah. Yeah. he we can't also, talk to you anymore. He is also not paid. So, um, <laughs> so there's a whole pe- whole lot of people who believe in this. We um, have a producer. His name's Bill Allison. Well, it's like we have a right, exactly. Producer, right? <laughs> Guys, I'm a technological idiot. Like, I please, if 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 this were going to be like a thing where I was responsible for me, no, Fletcher makes the whole show run. So, so um, how do you how do you um what a how do you how do you select the movies? But b you know tell us about you know since this is a military history or sure. podcast. You know, how, how, what kind of what kind of war films do you gravitate toward? Well, you know, it's a great question, right? So um, basically the idea behind the, the podcast, it's a, it's a deeper dive, right? It's mm-hmm. using a film uh, to talk about larger issues of scholarship and things like that, right? So initially the idea was like, just get scholars together to talk about movies that you love. And then to kind of pull the curtain back between like this idea of like this person who was up here this on this ivory tower, and get to know them as a person uh, and then talk about the things that they love. So sometimes the the film doesn't really reflect the scholarship that well, right? A case might be for Brett Rushforth, who writes about indigenous slavery in uh, New France in the 17th century. And he did uh, Up in the Air, the, uh, the George Clooney film, right? But he actually tied those things together really well. Uh, but to get to the larger points, like, so... You know, more recently, we had a joint friend of ours, Sarah Myers, who just came out with a great book called Earning Their Weeks, right? Uh, Talking about the WASPs, the Women's Air Service uh, uh, pilots um, during World War II and their fight for recognition after uh, World War II for as veterans. And the whole point behind that was Sarah's my friend. I wanted to hang out with her. I mean, that was it. And so as far as selecting people, it's people I think are cool uh and people i think people want to listen to and sarah if, and you guys know sarah she's amazing is yeah, yeah. she's awesome yep. she's awesome and this she wrote this amazing book and i'm so excited for her i want to get this thing out there to help promote it's like hey this is sarah she's awesome you should read her book right and but here's the kicker on this 
her book's about women in World War II. Well, guess what? There's not really any movies aside from maybe A League of Their Own that really focus on women in World War II. It's certainly not as pilots. Yeah. So what do you do? We chose Memphis Belle, you know, because it's the exact opposite. Here's a story about a bunch of men and men pilots in World War II. And then say, okay, let's talk about this movie and let's talk about what's also going on back in the home, back on the home front. What's going on on the for these women pilots who are doing this amazing stuff, making these uh these heroics possible in World War II. So did that um, you know, th there are films that I find interesting, you know, and a lot of times, you know. Sometimes I'll go to a scholar and be like, hey, we want to do a movie. You know, I see you got a book coming out. You want to do a movie, you know, pick anything you want. And they'll say, great. I've got this 1927 film that's a silent film about acorns. <laughs> and I'm like, because guys, we have a lot of nerds in our profession. And I'm like, it's not quite, we're, you you want a larger I film think I've seen that, that people maybe. are going to draw to, right? Um, so a great example, another military film might be Master and Commander, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, with an amazing scholar named Mary Hicks, who she's at University of Chicago. She actually she's of Afro-Brazilian uh, uh, heritage, and she actually writes about slavery in Brazil and things like that. So I said, went to Mary's like, hey, how about that? how about a film? She said, well, how about Quilombo, which is this film about uh, slavery in Brazil? And I was like, well, it's not quite what we're looking for. I'm like, what else you got? She's like, Master Commander. So we talked about Master Commander, and then we're able to use that to segue to talk about other things about shipping and slavery and stuff like that in the time period. So you can kind of use these larger films as entrance points to talk about more uh, finer examples of, of history and stuff like that. Um, we've done Platoon, which is a film that I've seen mm -hmm. on countless times, literally countless times, uh, to talk to uh, scholars about Vietnam. And we'll do more movies you know another film that i'm desperate to do is actually first blood i've talked about that before yeah. in other situations oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, a, yep. it's a phenomenal film as far as a military history film you know as we grapple with what ptsd is we really start to come to terms oh, yeah. with yeah. ptsd vietnam absolutely stereotypes of vietnam veterans yeah and you know here's the thing vietnam I'm talking about military history vietnam shows up everywhere in the 1980s you know yeah. there are jokes yeah. about vietnam in trading places eddie murphy when we yeah. first encounter him him is uh is pretending to be a, a disabled vet right yeah, so yeah. we talk about military history specifically specific to even to vietnam the shadow of vietnam hangs over american culture for decades and yeah. i suspect in some form or function so will say the war on terror or uh, or iraq or something like that uh, as well though i don't know as large as say maybe vietnam or say world war ii do in film um so I try to pair people with movies that often complement their scholarship, but largely allow them to kind of pick out the movies that, that that are good. You know, so I had some I had four guys, you know, I had four buddies of mine. We just got together. We did Kingdom of Heaven. So your military guys that want to talk about the Crusades. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk about yeah. Kingdom of Heaven, which is a beautiful right. film that's completely insane as far as what they do with the history. So right. we can make fun of it. We can enjoy the film. We can make fun of it. We can do it's and it's not the last thing we want to do is rivet counting. My friend uh, Waitman Bourne. Just came on <laughs> to do Fury. Yeah. yeah, that's what he called it. You know, we we did no, Fury that's recently. True. Yeah, and Wait Waitman's awesome because Waitman was actually a tank commander before he became a historian, so he could offer these really specific understandings. Right. Maybe not of being World War Two, World War Two, but what it's like to have those those bonds of unity between people and stuff like that. Um, so that's what I try to do. Is generally, I pick movies and scholars who I think. I think pick movies that people will be interested in hearing about because people don't want to watch, listen to a podcast about movies they've never heard of. They want to hear yeah. things they have relationships to. Sure. And then hear somebody cool talk about it. Because if you got no personality, it's it's hard on me to it's hard on me to carry a conversation for an hour and a half, two hours. And I've done it a couple of times. Um, but usually I just frankly, I just try to pick pick out my friends and people I think are cool. You know, yeah. it's 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 as simple as that. I'm not I'm not trying to overthink it. Well, hey. Um, we're available. Yeah, <laughs> let's go. Um, I'm down. And and but but B, uh, I was just thinking of like you know films that are coming up, like like you know the the Napoleon film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, that, that's already getting a lot of attention. And and I know I know a guy who who you could do use uh, Zach White over in the UK. Um, he's got a, a podcast called The Napoleonist. Oh, I'd love and, that. And and guy, I think he's had almost three hundred thousand plays yeah, now yeah. i mean the dude he, he's really good but but he's already been out there you know tweeting yeah. about it and, and stuff like that 
Uh, so I'd highly recommend them him to. Yeah, but, I tell you what, man. I, I was saying this the other day, though, in regard to the Napoleon film. I was like, if I want to sim- spend more time around people with Napoleon complexes, I wouldn't have left the Academy. So, <laughs> hey, I've got a huge bust of Napoleon in my office. Um, <laughs> he's wrapped up in a in a Viet Cong scarf, actually, which is nice. it's, it's called irony. Have, have you ever taught like a, a, a film his, history course, anything like nope. that? Did you ever do that? Yeah. No. Um, you know, so here's the, here's the interesting thing about what histor- historic of the movies has done for me on a personal level. Uh, I am not a film scholar. I'm not a pop culture scholar. At least I wasn't. Yeah. Uh, I came up writing about the native South, writing about indigenous warfare, environment, things like that. And then as I started HATM, and really, it was trading places that became the first thing that was like started to be, make me question what a quote unquote history film was, yeah. right? Uh, and over the last five years, I've increasingly turned my attention uh, attention towards pop culture, film, things like that. So I've never taught a course on it. I was uh, I was going to, and I certainly FAU had laid that on the table for me to teach if I wanted to. Sure. Um, I've come in to do guest lectures in other people's film courses and things like that. Yeah. I would tell you that if I went back and, and, and I do kind of flirt with the idea of sometimes returning to the classroom at a college in, in, in at a university, because I do miss being in front of the students. I love the thrill of seeing young folks learning things. I love the atmosphere of being on a college campus. Um, and I would tell you that I'm increasingly becoming more and more starting to understand myself more as an academic, as one of pop culture than say of indigenous stuff, which is kind of weird considering that's kind of what I've always done as a profession. Yeah. Well, you're, you're changing, you know, you're, there's right. growth there. there yeah. you're, it happens. You're evolving, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's... This, this is therapy with Jason. Let's talk about your growth. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> that's what, that, that's what we do. So what do you think? Yes. We uh, do a rapid fire, the rapid fire. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Go for Hold it. On a bit. Um, so Jason, what we do here is we, We'll ask you a series of questions. Brian will ask a couple. I'll ask a couple. Oh man! And uh, you know, answer as quick and, and as good as you can. Oh. And and as we always remind our guests, be mindful since it's our show. Yeah. Uh, we reserve the right to comment and judge your your responses. I can't wait to cancel myself just now. Let's do this. <laughs> um, I I, I got to tell you, this first question here is really going to provide a peek into your soul. Let us know what kind of person <laughs> yes. you are. Yes. All right. So, uh, first question. Who is the most successful coach in Wichita State history? There is no successful coach. I'm a Kentucky basketball fan. Damn. We don't recognize Wichita State. Oh, you blew it. God, you, you blew, blew it. it. You, blew you blew it. it. You blew it. The answer is Ted Lasso. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Not doing it. No, I don't Ted recognize Lasso. them. You know, yeah. Wichita State does not have a football team and hasn't had one since 1987. Yeah, I know. That's but why so, I was so – I was so beautiful that he that he chose that. Sudeikis. I love Ted. L- I'm not watching soccer TV shows. I'm an American oh, come on, man. So, so, but they had a you know, which else they had a good baseball run there for a while. Right? And, they did. They and, won and, the and national title in like ninety. Too. No, they did not. No, they did not. But they, I do not recognize Wichita State's basketball. The Wichita State dozens of fans stop. But I'm from, I'm from Kentucky. Just, oh, come on. Drop that not actually I'll tell you this. Wichita State actually their fan base is actually terrific. And going to see a game oh, yeah. at the Coke Arena, there's it's like a ten thousand person arena there. They are wild. As a pure basketball fan, I went to see a few of them. Incredible atmosphere, great sure. fan base, really terrific. Um, so yeah, if if I'm allowed to be actually serious about Wichita State for a second, actually they love basketball there and actually respected yeah. it. Okay, this is going to be a good question for you because right, uh, I, th- I think you've uh, you've probably um, you've got an answer. He's going to have an opinion. On yeah, this. I have favorite, an opinion on everything. Favorite fast food chain. Favorite fast food chain: Whataburger. Okay. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah. You know, we are actually getting a Whataburger in Spartanburg, South Carolina. They are moving east. I am a big, it. big fan of because I grew up in Texas, and and you know, Whataburger was a good thing, and I love it in King of the Hill when Bobby Hill you know gets to go to Whataburger. It's so I I'm a I'm a I'm I'm a, I'm a, I am a um a disciple of Whataburger and uh, uh Publix actually so yeah, yeah Publix I'm, yeah I'm gonna head over to Publix right after this and get some uh, five dollar Wednesday sushi there mm. you go man yeah because I got of course man. meetings all day um, I I do want to uh, we might get sued over this but uh, I yes just please say the one fast food chain I I really dislike is Cookout I you know I have to not a fan I I hate Cookout I have to yeah. concur. 
Yeah, not a fan of Cookout at all. I do not care for Cookout. Also, any fast food chain that serves Pepsi, I'm out on. <laughs> I do. It's right? well established. I do not drink Pepsi. I mean, you talk about a communist conspiracy. Pepsi, right? And and where it shows up, it's the taste I, born in the Carolinas. Oh my God! Friends. Yeah, awful. No, I have been known too sweet, to, not enough carbonation. If, if I see, if if I ask, you know, I ask for a Diet Coke, and I say, "Well, we have Diet Pepsi," I get up and walk out. <laughs> I have done that before in a restaurant. Right. I am that shallow. Uh, okay, Jason, you get to listen to only one band or singer for the rest of your life. Who is it? I love it. Wow, oh, that's a good uh, one. yes. Yeah. I saw him in concert for the very first time a couple, a couple three months ago in a really? small five hundred person place in Orlando. Was he it, was amazing. Large band or is it, is acoustic? Which one? It was an acoustic set, right? And I mean, there are other bands that I really love, really love Nathaniel Rateliff, love Chris Stapleton, yeah, yeah, uh, Jack Johnson, uh, our daily. The answer would have been Jimmy Buffett prior to his passing, yeah. um, but Lyle Lovett, most creative songwriter. Some of the stuff just and that band, just, that acoustic band, those guys are tight. Yeah, they're great. Right. It's great. So Lyle Lovett's my dude. So tight. Um, I've we we've been fortunate to see him over the years, probably I don't know ten or twelve times. Over he's amazing, and, and he's just and and what I like about him too. Wherever he's at, you know he he knows where he is at. Yeah, and he he's a he's a music historian, kind of like Marty Stewart is, and mm-hmm. and and he he knows where he's at, and like he'll talk about the local music scene and these people who came from that area and stuff. He's a, he's a, you talk about a storyteller. He's funny um, too. And we best really show I've funny. seen him with him though, was him and Robert Earl Keen oh. together, just the two of them sitting on the stage. It was in Greenville at the peace center, just sitting on the stage with, with their guitars around them, telling stories and playing. And it was the most amazing show. It was I'm going to, I'm going to ask him at some point in time to be, come on the pod. If I, if I can get him, um he's i've talked to him a couple times on twitter he doesn't follow me but every time he's messaged like like i've got yeah. messaged him and he's messaged back i've i've been like a little school kid you know oh, just like yeah, that's giddy. Awesome. i you know I, a huge fan. i bet he i bet i bet he bet he would i bet he'd do it um all right what are you binge watching what am i binge watching clearly not ted this? lasso yeah clearly not ted lasso <laughs> you know i don't you know the crazy thing is about HATM is I don't have a time to like watch a lot of TV. Sure. Yeah. Um, I would tell you the shows that I actually, here's my hot take. I think black sales is better than game of Thrones. Uh, if you've ever seen uh, black okay. sales, for those yeah. of you who like history, black sales takes place in the, it's a prequel to treasure Island. It takes place in the golden age of piracy. Right. Uh, binge watching, you know, I would tell you that Ahsoka was appointment television for me. Um, me and a couple of friends. I, my, my very good friend, Thomas Lecoq and I will like, like call each up after the episode and talk about everything through. And I've got a few, f- few friends like that. I'm a huge star Wars fan before anything else pretty right. much in life. Uh, so I loved Ahsoka loved and or um, black sales. I think was, it was really, really good. Scrubs is probably my favorite comedy of all time. Lo- and I can, I can pretty much binge West wing whenever I'm in a mood. So those are my, those are probably my, my binge shows. Very good. We like we like the Tie Fighter back on your shelf. Yeah. See, oh, just, thank you. He just gave you the answer to number seven. So if you want to change that, think of something else. Oh, I can I can oh, I can actually yeah, invalidate yeah. answer number seven, and uh, we can create okay. some problems in the in the in the we'll, archive. We'll, I'll, I'll, you, yeah, yeah. You'll come up with something. All right. I'll okay. I know the answer to this, but uh, but our Go guests don't. Um, and this is from my my Facebook uh, research. Is it okay to do curls in the squat rack? It is absolutely not okay, but that's the reason why I do them anyway. Um, I'm going to toss your name out. My very good friend, Elizabeth Vendito, she's a phenomenal historian up in New York. She was uh, actually my lifting buddy up in, when I was going to graduate school. She was like, you can't do squirrels to the squat work. I'm going to kill you. Um, and so every so often I'll, I'll text her pick and I'm like, look what I'm doing. She's like, you're an idiot. Um, no, it's not okay to do curls in the squat rack unless – like me, you can curl more than most people can squat. So, uh, so there's yeah, that. That's fair. I'm gonna I, that's, go with that. That's my, that's my ego place. talking. That's my favorite place to uh, to to do curls. Uh, I'll tell you actually this. In all seriousness, the straight the the straight bar, you can actually get a better curl off of uh, a better uh, constriction of your bicep uh, uh, when you're using that large barbell versus say an easy an, yeah. an, an easy bar yeah. or something like that. Yep. Okay. What fine. do you what are you reading for pleasure? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, so one of the best things that came out of my three best friends all went to law school with my ex-wife. Um, so I kept them in the divorce and we ended up starting a book club last year 
Uh, and it was just a complete, you know, after you come out of graduate school, you're so tired of reading all your stuff. All, all I wanted to do was go back and read something else. Yeah. And I was talking to my great friend, JP. I was like, you know, I want to go read Hemingway. I never really read Hemingway. He's like, well, I'll read Hemingway with you. And then my other buddy, Bart, was like, hey, I'll jump in. And then my other buddy, Mike, was like, hey, I'll get in there. And we just really, did we just start a book club? Um, so our book club is named after Hemingway. It's called the Good, Hard, and True Book Club. Because if you've read Hemingway, he kind of writes about things that are good, and hard, and true. And uh, we're currently reading Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Oh, okay. So yeah. just basically, and we've read all kinds of different stuff. We've read, we've read history. We, we, we've read uh, Hemingway. We've read, you know, um, uh, sales books, you know, all kinds of different stuff. Just each guy gets a, gets a nomination each month. And the other three guys have vetoes, and that's how we decide. I got I got to recommend for you then for, for Hemingway. There's there's a book called Hemingway's Boat. Okay. Hemingway's Boat, and I'm spacing on the author right now because that guy actually just had another book come out recently. But it's called Hemingway's Boat, and it's about his fishing boat. You know the one that was in Cuba. Yeah, I've, I've, I've yeah they yeah. they they have a recreation of that right. boat at the Bass Pro Shops in Isla Morada. So he kind of follows his you know trajectory, kind of telling the story through through the boat. Him ordering it, it being built, using it, all that. It's really, it's really pretty clever. It's it's a good, it's a good thing. Can I tell you my Hemingway, like the first movie we're going to do for history, once we get a production company going, it's about Hemingway. You guys yeah. have seen John Wick, right? Yeah. Do you know there's a John Wick story about Hemingway? Hmm. Hmm. Like, well, Hensio Batista, like his thugs killed Hemingway's dog in Havana while Hemingway was out and about. And I've got this idea. That this like this new version of history where Hemingway shows back up and starts kicking the crap out of Batista's guys in like a pre-59 thing. And he's got these two tattoos, right? One on his left arm, one on his right. Left arm says old man, the right arm says the sea. And he just shows up kicking the crap out of everybody, right? <laughs> and who's his God. best friend? Who's it? Who's his sidekick? Young guy named Fidel Castro. His his good buddy who's an attorney. Fidel never. Fidel never makes a villain term. He becomes a good guy. It's like all of this happens as uh, <laughs> this is like counter counter narrative. Like I, I want to make an Ernest Hemingway goes John Wick in Cuba with with a redemption arc for Fidel, Fidel Castro. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Just don't Sorry. just don't have the uh, fight scene on the stairs in Paris that lasts entirely too long. Oh my gosh, way too long. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. Since we figured out your Star Wars fetish, uh, we're yes. not going to ask you if, if the Star Wars fetish, or, or Star Trek. As we, as we intended, but so sticking with Star Wars, yes. Um, of the movies, like the yeah. straight Star Wars, you know, yep. direct Star Wars films, not the offshoot stuff, right? Uh, which is your favorite? And which Empire, which, Empire. Okay, which which is the one you'd throw away? I would throw away the entirety of the sequel trilogy. Um, I love my children too much to let them ever watch the Last Jedi. So uh, I, I, there are some real. Sequel trilogy is a complete mess. There was no real design from the very beginning. You've got some phenomenal actors. Daisy Ridley is really great as a character of Ray, and Adam Driver is probably the best actor of his generation. But for those of us who grew up, you know, I went to high school in the early 90s. I grew up thinking, reading Expanded Universe, uh, Timothy Zahn's yeah. Thrawn trilogy. That's the Expanded Universe I grew up. So it's so foreign to that. And had the sequel series been anywhere good, That'd be one thing, but they're 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 not. Um, so the answer is obviously Empire. I thought Rogue One was actually really really well done. I think Andor is phenomenal, as is Ahsoka. But uh, the answer has to be Empire, and uh, throw away the entirety of the uh, sequel trilogy, all of it. Okay. Let it well, yeet it yeet it into the sun. Is what I would say. <laughs> uh, just just to uh, throw a little something in there. Uh, that's how I feel about anything post Rocky Four when it comes to Rocky. <laughs> Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I totally. Yeah, yeah, you don't. How do you feel about Creed? Um, I just watched some this summer. They're not bad, but they're not part of the Rocky like overall trajectory for me. Um, I feel I like Rocky that. should have ended with Rocky Four. Yes. Uh, Rocky Five was an abomination. Yes. Um, and and it should just if you if you're a purist, you you stop at Rocky Four. Yeah, Rocky Balboa is tired. I mean, there's there's the the, the only thing I like about Rocky Balboa, you know, the great thing is like the part where Duke. It's like like we're gonna like 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 mold. It's like you can't lift your arms and yeah. you can't run. You know, it's like the, the montages are good. Oh yeah. Um, my favorite training montage is actually Rocky Two. It's actually my favorite of the Rocky films. Yeah. Where she's like, just win, and then he's like, win. Mick's like, what are we waiting for? Yeah. You know. So <laughs> well, not, not, to, not to defend the, the the Rocky right. 
five plus too yes. much. But you know, every once in a while, these guys got to make a boat payment. Yeah, they do. So, they got to they got to make I a little guess. Cash, right? Yeah. Um, all right, best Kentucky bourbon. What's your go to? Have over here right now. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm just gonna go simple. I'm gonna say Buffalo Trace. That's the distillery okay, I've yeah. been to. You know I, that. Yeah. That's you know, E. H. Taylor is like I got some special stuff. My my cousin, uh, who's e. like H. my Taylor's younger sister. All yeah, are, she yeah. lives there. Um, you know, there's a lot of good stuff. And you know, I came out here to Colorado. Coloradans are like, we make bourbon out here. I'm like, stop it, peasant. <laughs> you know what you're talking about. And then I had some. I was like, oh, this is good. <laughs> so, no, I like it. I, 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 Buffalo, Buffalo Trace, probably, but Buffalo Trace when you can find it. Yeah, because this probably it's safe. You can't you know like down here? Sometimes I know uh, the the my friends I stay with here. Uh, Terry keeps a, a good good cabinet, um, you know, well stocked. But sometimes you can't find Buffalo Trace, and, and where I'm at in Greenville, Spartanburg area, you, you can't find it sometimes. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, it's but there's a lot of good stuff out there. Oh, yeah. Look, like, I. The Kentucky enemy wants to be like nobody else can make bourbon, but you know what? In Iowa, Iowa knows corn. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Iowa can make you, have, you can you can make some good stuff. I just I like the as the historian actually in me it really enjoys counting the lineages of back to the old country in England and Ireland and Scotland yeah. uh, through whiskey and through like say bluegrass music and stuff like that. But right. you know, Bur- Buffalo Trace it's beautiful. Well, and they yeah, got a really makes, cool, beautiful. They make some facility. good vodka in Austin, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. So you, you yeah. can do it. You can pretty much can, do anything be anywhere. Yeah. yeah. All right. Your house is on fire. Your family is safe. Mm-hmm. You only have time to grab one item. What is it? You guys see that curious George underneath my finger. Or yes, just yes, above I my see. finger. Yeah. yeah. When I was three years old, our house burned down on Christmas. It was oh the only thing gosh. to survive. Are you kidding? Nope. Man. So that uh, so that Curious George there has been with me everywhere for 43 years. He wow. is the that is the single most important thing I have in this house that is not uh, uh, not related, obviously, to my kids or, you know, my dog or my 11 year old cat, Edward. Um Probably that. And then where else right above that would be my great grandmother's cookie jar that I got when she passed when she, when I was 10. Oh, so I've been, yeah. I've been carrying around a glass cookie jar everywhere I've gone for 36 years. So that's a one a and one B. All right. Uh, that is, that's awesome. Yeah. The that is George. That's the most legit. I think yeah, we've had a fan yeah, that question. Yeah. By far. Thank you, man. <laughs> Um, all right. Our final question, always our final Please. question. Uh, Bill is a Texan who uh, who enjoys brisket. I enjoy yep. brisket as well, but I'm a South Carolinian. And so for uh-huh. me, pork is king when it comes to barbecue. What is it for you? Pork, pork. or brisket? Yeah, pork. It's not even close. Yeah. Right. Not, a, not, a, not, a, not only is it pork, it's North Georgia pork. It's, that's North Georgia, maybe West Tennessee. But I like a good vinegar-based uh, yeah. sauce. Okay. I like a mustard based sauce as well. I do not want barbecue. I do not want mayonnaise or coleslaw anywhere near my barbecue. So that rules out most of North Carolina. Um, I like, I actually like Texas style barbecue, like Aaron Franklin's a God in my book. And you know, they do that, do that straight salt pepper kind of stuff like that. Yep. Yeah. Brisket. I respect. It's just really hard. I, I cannot even do a good brisket. It's so hard. If you can do a brisket really well, that's one thing, but frankly, brisket's a little too fatty for me. It's, so well, give me pulled also, pork. It's an expensive thing yeah. to to f up too. Yeah, it really days. is, and that's maybe the sad irony of it is that um, barbecue is uh, for the for the people, right? It's right. for mm-hmm. it's, yeah. it's poor people yeah, food. Brian and it's gotten crazy expensive, times, you know. Gone, it, it used to, yeah. you know, when I was a kid, it it's was Yeah, you uh, you go get barbecue, and it's affordable, and everybody can do it. And now it's just uh, yeah. yeah, but yeah. Pork, pork is king in West Kentucky. They do they do mutton up in like Owensboro, but that's not really my jam. I, I'm going to say pork. You uh, you want to give a shout out to any barbecue place you grew up with, or any place you found out there in Colorado? Actually, yeah, actually. So, you know, the interest people keep asking me like, what's it like in Colorado, right? How do you like it? I'm like, yeah, it's okay, it's great. Colorado feels like Maine and Oregon had a baby and then didn't feed it or water it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because the food out here is not good, generally speaking. And all the food out here comes from all the good food comes from someplace else. Oh, yeah. Um you just described it, the Netherlands. Yeah, <laughs> right. well, it's right. it's like <laughs> lots of places serve Pepsi out here because that's kind of a great plains thing. Cause they get like Kansas never understood like what food is or what salt is. It's like living in North Korea. Um, but 
I would tell you that here in Colorado, I found one place that blew my mind in totally an accident. It's in old Colorado city, which is near Manitou Springs, right at the base of Pikes peak. Uh, it's called front range barbecue. And it's two boys from Alabama opened this restaurant back up in like 2011. And I went there a couple of weeks ago and it was like a religious experience. I was like, holy, <laughs> not only is this, sorry about that. Not only That's is that a, a, not only is that good barbecue for Colorado, that was maybe the best barbecue I've had in my life. Yeah, and they yeah. serve Coca-Cola. So I was, I was like, you complete me. So I would say front range barbecue uh, here in, uh, here in Colorado. It's about an hour from my house uh, and it's phenomenal. So Awesome. How's that? Chase, this is super, man. Yeah, we, we really, really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, taking the time and everything. And 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 for everybody, check out Historians at the Movies. You will not be disappointed. Join yeah. one of their their movie things, which I, I want to do that. I want to I hang out. With Name the movie. Watch, Just watch better not be about thing. acorns in 1912. <laughs> Let's do Das Boot. Let's do, you, hey, what, yeah. What, what like what what war movies do you do you guys do? What, what's your specialties? Like what's your jam? So I like, I'm I'm most I'm mostly Vietnam. Brian is is a German historian, so oh, you know, yeah. the World War One stuff. Um, okay. Yeah. The and, and or anything war, you know World War Two ish and, and you know I guess same for me. But yeah, I, I keep thinking of things like Kelly's Heroes and Mash and oh yeah, um, you know st- st- films films like that that you know re- whatever they're they're whatever historical setting they're in they are right. reflections of the time they were done or absolutely like the wild bunch sure right the wild bunch um you know that that's sort because of, all those guys i mean sam, sam peck and they, they were all bloody like, movie they were all marine world war ii veterans from the pacific yeah yeah right well you know so i mean that's the crazy thing about warfare is that and obviously warfare is, is awful and terrible right yeah. but it reflects it it casts such a large shadow over civilization over the civilizations who are engaged in it for so long i you know growing up late generation x you know vietnam had an effect on everything that we did Uh, i would actually love to see vietnam war films from vietnamese perspectives just to understand that conflict more from 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 that horrible awful conflict right from that from their point of view but yeah yeah, let's do it like let's Let's talk. I'm down. Yeah, all right. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Well, look, thanks for, for yeah. thank, taking the thank time and, and, yeah. and enjoy the rest of your day out there in, in uh, sunny, uh, sun-baked uh, Pueblo. And, and My dudes, I'm making chili in like 10 minutes. It's going to sit on the, on the cooker yeah. for like eight so hours. What, what's, what's, what's the next big big hike you're going to do? Oh. What you got to do for, for work or otherwise? So I'm learning to fly fish because that's a thing oh, okay. now. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm heading out to Utah in a couple weeks. I'm going to go learn some more of Ute history, Ute homelands up in uh, Utah, visit some folks up that way. Uh, and I'm going to go visit. And while we're up there, I'm going to speak at the Front Range Early American Consortium about my weird career path. I've been mm-hmm. talking to students at BYU about non-traditional oh, cool, paths yeah. as a scholar, yeah. but also go fly fishing. So that's part, that's part of the gig is to like, is to pick up this new like so the the hiking thing like I dude my legs are still dead from Saturday I am so yeah no tired. I saw your thing on it's, Twitter yeah. it's so hard oh, that was a big um one. Yeah. I'm not built for hiking but uh, that was also fly climbing. fishing <laughs> oh my dude that yeah. was hard if it was, if yeah those scree fields on the south and I did it because my friend Kathleen Ballou was like she was like she's from Colorado she's like go hike the, the Spanish Peaks and then I did and I was like I hate you so um. I don't. I haven't picked it out just yet, but we'll yeah, have more coming. I had the. I hosted the Society for Military History meeting in in, in Ogden back in two thousand eight, and I remember uh, Dave Perry, who was then the head editor at North Carolina Press. First thing he did, he, he emailed me and said, "Hey, I can't wait to come out there. I'm going to go fly fishing." And I think he spent like two days on the Provo River. You know, yeah. just just that's where we're fly fishing. Yeah, yeah that's had a ball. Uh, apparently. Right. So yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, cool, man. Well, look, thanks. We appreciate it. All right, man. Dudes, thank you so much. Yeah. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. Take care. Take care. Bye, we'll right, guys. See you. See All you. Right.